First, I should say, by the way, <laughs> that I didn't conduct a scientific poll to actually discover the top 10 questions in Judaism about Christianity. I really have no idea what they are, and I'm sure no one else in the world does either. Uh, but what I did was I put together what I think are 10 important questions. I'm sure that if we were to sit together and brainstorm, we could find another 10. But these are 10, I think, important questions that we would have about Christianity. Number one. Number one problem is that Jesus failed to fulfill the biblical criteria for the Messiah. The Bible, our Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures, have a very clear picture of a king who will come from the line of David, and he will reign as the king of Israel during the future utop utopian perfection of the world. Meaning, our Bible speaks very clearly with hundreds of passages about a world that will be transformed in the future, that the Jewish nation is going to be reunited. The 10 lost tribes of Israel will come back. We're going to get together with them, with the rest of the people of Israel that we now have, the tribes of Judah, and that we will return to God. The Jewish nation, the people of Israel, are going to have a national revival, a national repentance, we're going to return to God, and the Torah tells us that when that happens, God will return us to our homeland, meaning that God will gather the exiles of the nation of Israel from all over the world. How do we know this? Because again, the Torah, the Tanakh, tells us this dozens of times. You don't need to be uh, an explorer with an electro microscope to find these references. The Tanakh speaks about it clearly, overtly, numerous times that there's going to be a national return from the exile. We're going to come back to our homeland. The Torah says to us that when we come back to our land, we're going to rebuild our temple and we're going to live in our land in peace and we will function as the nation that God intended us to be. God did not intend to create the, nation, the people of Israel to import high-tech products to the rest of the world. That's important, but it's not the reason that we came into existence. God said to Abraham that your people are going to be a blessing to the entire world, and through your people, the entire world will be blessed. And right before we receive the Torah at Mount Sinai, God says to us, you're going to be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. Priests are teachers. And the prophet Isaiah tells us twice that we're going to be a light unto the nations. And that's supposed to be our task in the world. We're supposed to be teachers of humanity. And that will happen when we return to our homeland from the exile and our temple is rebuilt. We're going to actually function as the ambassadors of God. And then the Tanakh tells us that the world will finally come to our light. You see this, for example, in the 60th chapter of Isaiah. We're told that one day the nations of the world will come to our light. The prophet Zechariah in his 8th chapter says that in that day, 10 people from every nation of the world will grab hold of the clothing of a Jew and they're going to say, we want to follow you because we've heard God is with you. And with that will be the spreading of the knowledge of God to the entire world, as the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah says in his 14th chapter, in that day, God will be one and his name will be one. And then we're told in the 11th chapter of Isaiah that with the spreading of the knowledge of God through all of the humanity of the world, peace will spread across the planet. People will beat their swords into plowshares, and there'll be peace and no more war. That's what the Bible describes. And the Torah tells us that at that time, there's going to be a wise and righteous descendant of David who will reign as the king of the Jewish people. How do we know when the Messiah is here? When that world has changed, as the Torah describes. The Torah tells us what the world will look like when the Mashiach is here. The Torah doesn't describe the Messiah as a person. 
other than saying he'll be a descendant of David, he'll be wise, he'll be righteous. But it doesn't give you a, a wanted poster. He'll be 6'3", he'll have red hair, right? We don't have that. He'll weigh 260 pounds. That we're not given. We're told general ideas. He'll be a descendant of David. Well, there are millions of descendants of David. Wise. There are plenty of smart Jews. Righteous. Plenty of righteous Jews. So how do you know who the Messiah is? Because the Torah describes a changed world in ways that you cannot duplicate what the Tanakh predicts. When we see all of the people of Israel return to our homeland, the temple rebuilt, world peace, you can't miss that. And when those things happen, we look to Jerusalem to see who's sitting on the throne of David. That's the Messiah. And Jesus didn't do that. And because Jesus didn't do that, Christianity was forced to invent the, the doctrine of the second coming. The doctrine of the second coming, which says, yes, Jesus will do all those things when he returns. But the doctrine of the second coming is an admission that he didn't do it when he was here. It's an admission that he failed to fulfill the clear messianic prophecies of the Torah when he first came. Number two, the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, and Christian apologists attempt to find hundreds of clues in the Hebrew Bible proving that Jesus was the Messiah. And the problem is that all of these hundreds of clues do not hold up. They simply do not hold up. They're based primarily upon circular reading of the Bible, a circular reading of the Bible, which requires an initial acceptance, carte blanche, of the claim that Jesus was the Messiah. So the entire Christian reading of the Jewish Bible requires at the outset that we accept their conclusion. Jesus was the Messiah. And then what they attempt to do is read back into the Bible and find snippets and sound bites that sound like Jesus in order to shoehorn him back into the Jewish Bible. As the Magid of Dubna used to tell the, the parable of the person who goes into the forest and sees ten trees, and on each tree is a target with an arrow right in the bullseye, and the person sees all these arrows and they can't believe, how did anyone shoot ten arrows so accurately? And he finds someone that has a bow and arrow and says, did you shoot those arrows? And the person says, yes. He said, how did you do that? It's amazing. He said, it's not a big deal. I first shoot the arrow into the tree, and then I draw the target around the arrow. <laughs> this is precisely the way Christian proof texting works. This is how Christian proof texting works. And again, people who study these Christian proof texts realize because of this, they don't hold up. This kind of proof texting requires that scripture be taken out of context and insisting that passages that are not really about the Messiah are speaking about the Messiah. Meaning that anything that sounds like Jesus gets rubber stamped as a messianic prophecy. As an example, so Jesus was crucified. So any time they find a passage which might speak about someone being killed, that becomes a messianic prophecy. Why? Well, because Jesus was killed. It becomes a messianic prophecy. Not that they read the Bible from Genesis straight forward and asking the question, what is the Bible actually teaching? What does the Bible actually say? And then seeing if it speaks about Jesus. No. They begin with Jesus and try to find anything that sounds like Jesus. So, for example, in one Christian mistranslation of the 13th chapter of Zechariah, they read verse 6 to say, they're going to ask this person, what are those wounds in your hands? And many Christians insist, that's talking about Jesus. He's got wounds in his hands. But when you read that passage, the whole chapter from the beginning, chapter 13 is speaking about false prophets who will be killed. 
And that's why the vast majority of any Christian scholar or real Bible commentary will say that chapter is not talking about Jesus. But again, someone who's obsessed with seeing Jesus in the Jewish Bible, any time it sounds like Jesus, even if the passage cannot be about him, it gets rubber-stamped as a messianic prophecy. This also leads them to mistranslating passages in the Jewish Bible, as in the famous virgin birth passage from Isaiah, which is not speaking about a virgin giving birth, it's speaking about simply a young girl that gets pregnant. But again, because of their zeal and obsession with finding clues for Jesus, it leads them to take passages out of context and mistranslate. Number three, Christian theology has led to the unfortunate deification of Jesus, insisting that he is God who came down to earth and took on human form, plus the unfortunate development of the clearly non-biblical doctrine of the Trinity. These two ideas of the incarnation, the idea that God took on human form and that Jesus was God in the flesh, and the unfortunate doctrine of the Trinity are very serious problems for Christianity. These ideas are so problematic that there are a number of Christian denominations as well as a very quickly growing number of Christians from many denominations that do not accept these ideas. Number four, there are numerous Christian doctrines that clearly contradict the teachings of the Hebrew Bible. One very significant one is their insistence that the only way a person can be forgiven for their sins is through having a blood sacrifice shed on their behalf. This is an axiom of Christian theology that the only way a person can be forgiven of their sins is to have blood of a sacrifice shed on their behalf. The Bible, the Hebrew Bible, never once teaches this and actually consistently teaches something quite different. One of the major teachings of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew Bible, is that atonement and forgiveness of sins is available to us if we repent if we turn away from our sins, if we regret our sins, and if we turn back to God, the Tanakh promises us consistently that we can be forgiven without ever saying that we have to have a sacrifice shed its blood on our behalf. For example, the book of Jonah, when the prophet Jonah goes to Nineveh and tells them that God is very upset with them, he doesn't tell them they better start bringing sacrifices. And at the end of chapter 3, God sees that they repented. They turned away from their evil ways and God forgives them. So we see in this book that God forgives the people of Nineveh because they turn away from their sins. He doesn't forgive them because they bring sacrifices. The 18th chapter of Yechezkel, the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, is a golden chapter where the entire chapter teaches over and over and over again that we have the ability to be reconciled through God to God through repentance. So this idea of Christian theology being out of step and contradicting the Hebrew Bible is not just regarding this doctrine about forgiveness for sins, it's also true about the insistence in Christianity that we need to believe that the Messiah has died for us to be forgiven. The Jewish Bible never once speaks about the need to believe in the Messiah who will die for our sins. It's not, not stated once. Also, the Christian doctrine of original sin, that because Adam and Eve sinned, each one of us is held guilty and responsible also totally foreign to the Jewish Bible, and as well the Christian doctrine of Satan as basically a fallen angel who has rebelled against God 
and has led all the demons in the world in a war against God. In the Jewish Bible, Satan does not lead an opposing team against God. In the Jewish Bible, Satan is one of God's angels and actually plays a role on God's team. Number five, in many Christian denominations, faith in Jesus has totally replaced observance of the Torah. Now I'm speaking here specifically about what we refer to as mitzvot ben adam makom, what Christians sometimes refer to as the ceremonial laws or the ritual laws. I'm not suggesting that Christians don't believe in the laws about not killing and not stealing, etc. But when it comes to all of the particularly ritual laws of the Bible, like the holidays and Shabbat and the dietary laws and the laws of sexual purity between (coughs) husband and wife, all of these laws of the Bible in Christianity, at least in almost all denominations, have been replaced by faith in Jesus and insisting that these laws of the Torah were done away with. It's a serious problem because God says in the Torah that his laws are forever, they're eternal, they are throughout our generations, unto a thousand generations. It's one of the things that the Torah says so many times, that the laws of the Torah are eternal. Number six, I'm sorry, let me just back up for a second. In addition to uh, abolishing the the binding nature of many commandments in the Torah, we know that many denominations in Christendom change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. I would say also a very serious problem. Number six, anyone that studies the Jewish Bible, the Torah especially, will see that it very clearly requires an oral Torah to be understood. The Torah virtually never explains itself and it would be impossible to practice the laws of the Torah without God explaining exactly what is supposed to be done. So for example, the Torah says to us that we're not supposed to do any melacha on the Sabbath and it's a capital crime, and yet the Torah never defines what is melacha. It's a word that is not appearing anywhere else in the Bible. There's no information in the Bible about what exactly is included in the prohibition of melacha. The Torah says to us to take something and bind it as a sign upon our arm and as totafot between our eyes. There's no explanation at all what this sign is supposed to be on our arm, What in the world are totafot? Every single commandment in the Torah is inexplicable without an oral Torah. Even the question of at what age do we become obligated to observe the Torah? At what age? The Torah has punishments for failing to observe the Torah. Is it at the age of 8, 9, 10, 15, 21? The Torah never tells us. So the Torah itself screams out that there's an oral Torah and Christianity has totally rejected the idea of an oral Torah. Even though, by the way, Jesus in the 23rd chapter of Matthew seems to insist that his followers observe the teachings of the oral Torah. He says to his followers in the 23rd chapter of Matthew that the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Therefore, he says, everything they teach you, you must observe. Now, if Jesus had rejected the oral Torah, he would have said the Sadducees are the people you should follow because the Sadducees rejected the oral Torah. But he teaches his followers to follow the teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees. And yet, historical Christianity has rejected the oral Torah. Number seven, For Christians, this is a serious problem. But Christians who study their Bible notice an incredible discontinuity between the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of Paul. Jesus seems to have affirmed the observance of the Torah. When someone in the 19th chapter of Matthew asks Jesus how he can achieve eternal life, he says, good 
teacher, good master, what must I do to achieve eternal life? Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? There's only one good and that's God. And if you want to achieve eternal life, keep the commandments. So throughout the three years of Jesus' ministry, he's constantly emphasizing the importance of keeping the commandments. He says in the famous fifth chapter of Matthew, think not that I've come to abolish the Torah. I've not come to abolish it to fulfill it, he says. And therefore, he tells his students, anyone who teaches people not to follow the least of the commandments will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who teaches people to keep the, the greatest, the least of the commandments, and to observe them will be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So students of the Christian Bible are bothered by the consistent discontinuity between the teachings of Paul and the teachings of Jesus, where Paul says, you are no longer under the curse of the Torah. Paul is constantly teaching that faith in Jesus replaces the observance of the Torah. Number eight, the Christian scriptures, what's called the Greek Testament or the New Testament, constantly is quoting from the Hebrew Bible. The Christian Bible is constantly quoting from the Jewish Bible in order to affirm and to prove their theology. Constantly looking to the Jewish Bible to prove and substantiate their beliefs. However, if you study what is actually quoted in the Christian Bible, very frequently it does not line up with the text of the Jewish Bible. The text that's quoted in the Christian Bible does not look like it comes from a Hebrew Bible, and it often doesn't. It comes from the Septuagint. They're not quoting from the Masoretic text. And that's a tremendous problem because the Jewish Bible was not given in Greek. It was revealed in Hebrew. And so the New Testament's reliance, not on the actual Hebrew Bible, but its reliance on the Septuagint, what we call the Targum Shivim, is a tremendous problem. Number eight, I'm sorry, number nine. Number nine is often overlooked by many students of the Christian Bible. Hashem, the Almighty, is always speaking in the Tanakh. In the Hebrew Scriptures, it's Hashem that speaks. Anyone that reads the Greek Scriptures, the Christian Bible, will notice that Hashem never speaks. He never speaks in the Christian Bible. He has plenty to say in the Tanakh, in the Jewish Bible, never speaks in the Christian Bible. And finally, number 10, I would say is a serious problem for Christianity, has been their 2,000-year-old hostility and rejection of Hashem's witnesses. God says that Israel, the people of Israel, are his witnesses. That's chapter 43, verse 10 in Isaiah. We are the people that God designated to be his witnesses to his truths. And the church has consistently rejected, often persecuted, God's witnesses. And there's been an ongoing hostility towards the Jewish people from the church. I think there are actually many other problems, many other questions that could be raised, but I would say these are 10 very serious issues.